Major General Retired Edward McIntyre. He just did our POW MIA ceremony, and everybody was just wowed by him. And his message is, his just overall personality and what he's been through has just been amazing. And it makes you reflect on your life, it makes you realize what things that may trouble you as you go through your days and your weeks and your hours and everything else really aren't that big of a deal. Because a lot of this is not only for leadership, but it's, it's for our airmen. It's for you know soldiers, sailors, and Marines also when they go to those bases. And what it allows us to do as supervisors is it gives us tools to talk to our airmen and reminders to say, you know what, General Meckenbeyer went through this. This is not that big of a deal. We will get through it. We will get through it together. is three years and 11 days after I was commissioned. As a matter of fact, 14 June 1967, and I'm the guy dressed in white on this side anyhow, that uh, right after I got shot down, as soon as we can tell this picture was taken clandestinely about uh, 10 or 15 minutes after I was shot down because not long after that they came in with a great big machete and they cut these things off me which scared the heck out of some of my private parts because the machete was about that long. Uh, they were making sure I didn't have anything hidden under there like a gun, I guess, which I already got rid of. When I jumped out of my airplane about 30 miles northeast of Hanoi, you know, you go through all the survival training, get all the good training. I, I went through uh, Siri school, I went through survival, jungle survival school in the Philippines. And uh, I was on my 113th mission, my 80th over north, as, uh, as the Colonel said, when I was just two weeks short of coming home and oop, got a zero. Had a job with American Airlines, I was going to get out of the Air Force when I came home. Had a little bit of time to do that. I go become one of those snazzy, sexy airline pilots. As it was, I had to stay a fighter pilot, and but uh, worked out pretty good. But then they cut all my clothes up. When I jumped out of the airplane doing uh, 700 miles an hour, 620 knots, I won the award for the fastest ejection, which is a good thing. It's 4,500 feet upside down, and by that time the airplane was just a fireball. And the guy said, two seats came out of the bottom. I used to be an inch and a half taller, but the uh, ejection seat force. Uh, Broke my back in a couple of places, and so a um, little bit shorter now. And um, they were shooting at me on the way down. Got a bunch of cops in here, right? Both, both, both you uh, the patrol guys and you uh, silo guys, yeah. What's the 38 caliber pistol good for? <laughs> I carried 50 rounds of uh, tracer ammunition because I knew that was a signaling device. Only, and I didn't need it because I was landing in a bunch of them and they were shooting at me on the way down. I just heard the bullets go by, so I got rid of my <coughs> weapon. And uh, that's why they cut all my clothes off me because they knew they saw the holster, they were looking for the gun. Anyhow, and I started my time in the uh, Hanoi Hilton, built in the 1890s by the, Vietnam, by the French to put Vietnamese in. And uh, typically it's about 80% size because the average Vietnamese is about 80% of us, as you'll see in one of the pictures later on here, the old uh, Maison Centrale. The, uh, the uh, name Walo, H-O-A-L-O, means hellhole, and this place was that. It was built for that. A couple of pictures here just to give you a feeling for the inside of the prison where we live. This is one of the rooms, had a little Judas door, as we called it there. Inside the cell, and this is a picture I took in 2007, two concrete slabs. The cell is about seven by nine, and if you make a left, enough left-hand turns, you can walk eight to 10 miles a day in a cell like this, and that's what we did. I spent four years in a room like this with one other fellow, Kevin Joseph Patrick McManus, and Kevin walked faster than me. So I'd be walking, I'd be three steps this way, and I'd come back this way. So about every third or fourth time, Kevin would have to do this to get around me. Then when you got tired of going that way, you'd go the other way. <laughs> so uh, but we spent about 23 hours and 50, 55 minutes a day in the cell. You get out of your cell twice a day, uh, twice to, uh, to go out and get your food, 10 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then one of you got out to empty your, your honey bucket, which is a two-gallon uh, jug, can, uh, twi uh, once a day to do that. And I don't know where they thought you were going, you know, where they thought we were going to go at night. You know, six-foot-tall white guy, didn't speak any Vietnamese, but just inside that prison at night, very often they'd... And sometimes it was kind of random when they did it. They put our feet in footlocks and then lock the door and then go away and just leave you there uh, 
until the next night. The Wallow prison was great when they had you know, a, a few uh, guys there keeping them in, in isolation, but eventually, when it got over 500 POWs, they had to expand into uh, other prison camps, and this happened to be an old movie studio. So the fun thing about it here is they just took a warehouse that had movie sets like a living room, a kitchen, and a dining room, not a kitchen as we know it, but uh, different rooms of a house in it, different backdrops, different settings, and then they just put up uh, uh, brick walls between them, and we lived like that. Uh, this was kind of a nice uh, accommodation by all uh, standards. No running water, no heat, no electricity, but you know, not bad. And this represents all the earthly belongings of the average uh, prisoner of war. For the first four years, we just had one blanket, a golf towel, air conditioning unit, just looks like a bamboo fan, a mosquito net, a cup. We got about two liters of water a day. Uh, a toothpaste tube, which was wonderful because it was lead. We could uh, make notes with that. A, a toothbrush and tires for, for sandals. They'd just take the tread off of a, a truck tire. If you were really classy, you got a Russian tire as opposed to a Chinese or a Japanese tire. And back in the day, uh, they had inner tubes, and that's what made the straps across the toes. Now, the Vietnamese had what we called the speed strap. Ours were just like a, a thong, so you couldn't run very fast. But the Vietnamese had the same footwear, but it had a strap around the back that went across the back of your heel so they could run. And so at night, you put your mosquito net up, and that was the only time you ever had any privacy. And generally, there, there was a light bulb on uh, most of the time, except during air raids at night. But this is kind of instructive here in that that's, say this is about a foot long pair of shoes. And that's the average rat in Vietnam, about uh, 15, 18 inches long, nose and tail. They ruled the world. You could try to chase the boy, they'd just look at you like, you got a problem, but I'm, I'm here too. Uh, that's a spider, about that size. Snakes, if they don't sag going across an 18 inch uh, slit trench, that's a snake and not, rather than a worm. And we had uh, an interesting situation. They put us up in the Chinese border for the last, uh, about the last eight months. And the guard said he'd be back in a little bit with uh, a lantern so we could put our mosquito net up. So these two guys are fumbling around and they find this cell is about, like I say, nine by seven. It's got an L-shaped bunk, and they're sitting there. A little bit later, sure enough, the guard comes back in with his lantern, holds up, pulls out his hand, bang, 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 and he killed this cobra that was right between these two guys. They were sitting in their bunk in the complete darkness, and there was this cobra that was just sitting between them, looking like they had no idea he was there. So it was funny. I mean, the, the cobras were, were not, it's not an aggressive snake, to <coughs> guess. Unless you did. Because uh, I was laying on a bunk one day uh, shooting dice with my cellmate. And you just get that sense that there's somebody looking at you, there's somebody watching. And I looked over, and there was a cobra right behind me, just sitting there, just watching us shoot dice. Yeah. I do not miss those. OK, and our diet was about six to 800 calories a day, depending on who you talk to. About 40,000 kernels of rice twice a day. Had time to count. And then about a, uh, like I say, about a liter of water and about an equal volume of, of soup. Uh, they take pumpkins or lily pads, turn up tops or something like that, just chop it up, and then uh, boil it for 20 minutes, and that's what we ate. These are the clothes they gave us. Uh, this is what we call our mess dress. And we wore these only when you went to interrogation, otherwise you just wore a pair of shorts and, and a shirt that they gave us. Hey, you, you hear it all the time, and, and that's why we have things like commander's calls and all calls and things like that. You know, there's a message we want to communicate, and, you know, the whole idea is you all take your message back and share it with other people. Well, we had to communicate too, and so what we do is we came up with what's called a tap code. A fellow by the name of Smitty Harris uh, is credited with bringing this in. So if I wanted to say hi, you'd go down two, and then cross three. I. So that was, it seems like a kind of a slow and tedious way to communicate, but again, you know, we weren't going anywhere. We came up with a lot of good abbreviations, but eventually, you get to the point where you're comfortable with this thing and, and you know the person with whom you're uh, tapping through the wall, it almost sounds like something like this. My N A Can't hit the wall here. My name. So you get to get a feel for how fast it was, like a den of runaway woodpecker, somebody said. Five by five matrix. Um, no K. Only bad words have K's in them, usually preceded by a U and a C. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we come up with, like I say, a lot of abbreviations to make it work. And uh, we would communicate between 10 o'clock, between uh, noon and 2 o'clock when the Vietnamese 
took their siesta because they didn't want us communicating. You were not supposed to see or talk to anybody other than the, the people who were in your cell. You know, if I were to do this, what do you do? Some Vietnamese never figured that out. <laughs> So when we'd communicate, the Vietnamese knew we, we had the tap code, and they would uh, get to the ears of the wall, and sometimes they'd even try to write down what we were doing, but you know, we were so fast they couldn't catch the numbers and things like that. So one night the Vietnamese came into my cell, and they said, tap on the wall, you will communicate. They were trying to, to get the guy on the, on the side, in the cell on the other side of the wall, and they said, what do you mean? I don't, I don't, I don't communicate, I don't know tap, what do you mean? So they showed me exactly on a wall where I tapped every day, because they had walkways across the top of the building, they could see where we were. And so I go to the wall, and I, we went outside, had a little physical adjustment, came back in, I agreed to do it. And uh, I'm tapping on the wall, and no response. Tap louder. No response from the other side. I'm tapping right on the wall where I normally did. And I, maybe he's not, so I'm, eventually I'm banging on the wall, and no response from the other side. The Vietnamese run around the other side of the building, going to cell, and the room was reverberating, and they said to Jim Castor, why don't you respond? He's tapping with you. And he said, who? What we'd never, what the Vietnamese did is they knew the tap code. They beat that out of guys, but what nobody ever gave up was, as long as they didn't get a tap, tap back, you knew it wasn't an American. So the Vietnamese would get on the wall, and they'd start tapping, but they didn't know the shaver the haircut, never responded, and so we could, we'd never got trapped that way. Like I said, you know, the Vietnamese never wanted us to see each other, and when you were outside, you know, there was never any other American outside, or you had to lower your eyes or something like that. But every once in a while, they'd screw up. You know, they'd have you out emptying your honey bucket the same guy, same time somebody else was. So one day, at the corner of the pool hall in the garage, we gave all the buildings names, I run into Navy Lieutenant Commander Ted Kaufman. And he goes, oh, good morning, sir. First Lieutenant Ed McEnbar, how are you? No, 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 I'd get your rifle butter or bayonet real quick. Yeah, hey, you know, you flip each other off, then you go back in the cell and say, hey, who did I run into this morning to pull hall in the garage? Well, the Vietnamese are what knew about this stuff. Well, every time the guard came to the door, you had to bow. You look up, you know, the guard may be flipping you off because they'd understood it. You know, they wanted to be like these golden hand reprobates. You know, they, they knew we were cool. They knew we were some kind of uh, great supernatural beings. And we had told them all those UCK words. We had them believe, you know, F you very much was the only way to say good morning, you know, and all the rest of that good stuff. <laughs> F you know well, if you want the Christmas package, F you know well. And then somebody remembered that once upon a time he'd been a Cub Scout. And, you know, tapping on the wall is good. And of course, when you're going across the distance, you use a hand coat. But we also found out that you can talk through a wall, literally. You put the cup up against your face, and you can talk very slowly and kind of project your voice. You can listen. And now we really started you know, sharing all kinds of wonderful information and getting a lot of questions about individual backgrounds and who the person was next door, more than just you know, rudimentary stuff that, uh, that we were sharing. Interesting thing, the first guy I talked to through the wall had been there two years when I got shot down. So I, I had a lot of really good stuff to pass him, one of which was two days before I got shot down in June of 1967, I was that far away from General William Omeyer, who was the commander of 7th Air Force, who promised us the war would be over in two months. How wonderful. These generals are just brilliant people. <laughs> so I get up there and I tell Navy Lieutenant Commander Bob Shoemaker, have I got news for you? I just got shot down. We're going home in two months. We'll be home for Christmas, Thanksgiving, maybe even Labor Day. Oh, well, six years later. <laughs> <laughs> If you were communicating, like I said, the Vietnamese really were uh, out to keep us from communicating. They didn't want us to be organized because they knew if we were talking to each other and we had some common uh, background, uh, you know, that they would, uh, you know, we would have some, some form of resistance and accountability amongst ourselves, I mean, what we were doing. So they would uh, manacle your hands like this as a, as a minimal punishment. And if you, they, this is the actual size. I said earlier, everything was 80% size. This is the actual size of the manacles. One of the guys brought them out, and it's a... Uh, missing the screw that went through the, uh, the right side as you look at the picture. But if they really wanted to get, ring your bell, they put your feet in foot locks like this, you know, manacled your, or handcuffed you together. But the problem here now is you, you couldn't tuck your mosquito in it. So this is really when you became friends with the, with the rats that would just like to get in there, not, not chew on you, not, you didn't have any food or anything. So they were just getting in there to stay warm in the winter. And here's what your feet look like when uh, they put you in the foot locks and left you like that for a, a week or so. I spent 
uh, seven days with my feet and foot locks like that and my hands manacled behind my back at one time. Again, just because they were uh, upset because I was communicating. The, uh, the real method of <coughs> physical abuse, if you like, or torture was they take your feet, tie them together, put your hands behind your back with the uh, back of your wrists touching each other, and then rotate your hands up over your head, dislocating one or both of your shoulders, and then tying your feet, to your hands to your feet. A variation on the theme was a loop, a rope around your neck. So it felt like you were, you were choking to death. So if you've ever had a dislocated shoulder, you know that it's a, it's a permanent lifestyle after that in terms of what you're able to do. And if they wanted you to meet an anti-war delegation, but they didn't want you to be black and blue and have scars and bleeding all over your body, they just keep you awake for four or five or six days by uh, putting you in a situation like this, and whatever you started to doze off, they just throw water on you. These pictures, by the way, were, were drawn by one of the uh, returnees, uh, Captain Mike McGrath, after he got home in uh, 1973. Everyone then just wanted to beat the crap out of you because it was you know, psycho the torture, wanted to get some uh, excess energy off. They'd put you on the ground like this, generally with somebody holding your hands and your feet, and then just take a fan belt and wail on your fanny uh, for some period of time. Every once in a while, they, uh, they, they would actually rub after your fanny started to blister up, They'd rub salve on your fanny just like to make it like a callus. We never understood why, but it was maybe just because they didn't want you permanently scarred, I guess. After the Sante raid in November of 1970, which was an attempt to, uh, to rescue a bunch of POWs from a prison camp that's about 20 miles southwest of the downtown area, a relatively remote area. So anyhow, the Vietnamese then panicked and put us all downtown in, in the big French prison in some large rooms that they had. So now we had 39 guys in this room. We had about 19 inches to lay on this concrete slab. And we went nuts. I mean, after, after uh, four, five, six, seven years of uh, being in small cells, all of a sudden we got a whole bunch of guys together. And it just took days, really, to put the voice and the impression that you had on Ted Kaufman or Wayne Waddell to actually match it up with the person you were really looking at. We had now what we called Hanoi University. We started having classes in French, Russian, Spanish, and German. We had days where you couldn't speak English. Uh, we had those mathematics questions, you know, we did algebra, we did trigonometry. Okay, but then, you know, the whole idea was, you know, people look at us and they say, oh, gee, I could never do that. I couldn't last a month. I couldn't last two months. I hear that so many times. Believe me, I did not volunteer for this duty. Did not get any special training. It was unique to those of us who were selected to be POWs. We were products of environment. We were just like, anybody in this room would go into the experience and do the exact same things we did. People don't understand that, you know, we weren't any different. And you take things for granted. When's the last time somebody got burnt because the hot water was on the right and the cold water was on the left? Just doesn't happen. Light switch is always right there, you know, opposite the hinges, you know. One day, back in the small cell days, Ben Ringsdorf is watching Tom Hall take a dump. And for years, we've been sitting on this rusty bucket to do our business. And you know, in a seven by nine cell, I mean, how far are you going to go when somebody else is, is doing something? So Ben says to Tom, you know, it'd be a lot more comfortable if you sat on your sandals rather than on the edge of the rusty bucket. Just an example about how we take things for granted and how then again, simple things can mean so much. And then it all ended. The war was over, finally. The protocol uh, provided that we would be released in four groups, uh, coincident with the re uh, removal of the last uh, 100,000 or so uh, GIs from South Vietnam. And uh, in so in February of 1970, the 12th of February 1973, uh, the repatriation process started. We wore clothes that we got like an hour before they put us on the bus, so we looked good. And here's a picture of the world's greatest fighter pilot. As I said earlier, obviously wearing a toupee. Uh, the Vietnamese would shear us about every six months and let it grow, and this just happened in February when it hadn't been shorn in some period of time. And, uh, and we left. We didn't kiss them goodbye. We didn't smile until we turned and were headed back uh, towards the back end of the C-141, which uh, brought us out. And here's a picture of the aircraft uh, as it broke the ground. The man with whom I've spent uh, four years with, Kevin McManus, world's greatest fighter pilot, in case you missed that. And uh, they actually had an, a uniformed American uh, colonel or general officer come to uh, preside over each of the uh, repatriations. And the Vietnamese never provided a list and says, here's all the people we have. The Americans had to say, do you have Jim Shively? Do you have Kevin McManus? Do you have uh, Joel Youngblood? Do you have some, Joe Milligan? Do you have Ed McInbire? And they said, yes. And then they said, then they'd call us forward, and we were repatriated. 
So as part of American 300, which normally brings you world-class athletes. Robbie Powers, who was the, uh, the founder of the organization, you know, 14 years Olympic biathlete and coach. Uh, brings out other great uh, American athletes here. I'm the one military guy other than a few wounded warriors who are starting to join us now to go out and tell their amazing stories, you know. But I want you to take from my experience the fact that I didn't do anything that you couldn't do. We individually as a group were just reflective of the training and of the character of our United States military. The world has gone to hell in a handbasket. It's gone soft. Bull crap. And you're the people who are making our Air Force what it is. Like General Wells says, we may be smaller, but we're still the best damn Air Force in the world. And we're going to stay that way because of people like you. Thank you, and God bless you all.